Hello, this is the webinar on forensic ornithology. Um, I would like to make sure that you also uh, realize that we have some club coordinators and Tracy Clanton Smith, the technology person, uh, also the host of this webinar. So hopefully um, we can help with any kind of technology issues that you might have. Um, this webinar is, is completely through integrated voice IP, so there's not any uh, calling in through a teleconference. And I'd like to introduce, uh, I've, I've had about 25 years in education, all in computer technology instruction, as an uh, instructor for a school district. I've also had uh, several years as an online school coordinator. So I bring quite a bit of technology uh, to the table. I'd also like to introduce, first of all, uh, for our math part of things, Pam Summers. So Pam, why don't you talk to everyone and welcome. Welcome to our webinar. Welcome, everybody, and I'm very excited that you all are participating, and I'm hoping that we can give you some information a little at the same time. Uh, I've been I'm in public education for 36 years, and I continue on to my 37th year, and I have been a math teacher at the secondary and middle school level. I've been a school counselor. I have, and I have been a central office administrator. And now I'm looking forward because now I can just be a distance instructor with Texas Tech. So I'm really looking forward to that, slowing down just a little bit. And I'd like to introduce to you our science coordinator is Sharon Story, and she can tell you a little bit about her experience. We're excited about this year and the things that we have to offer you. I'm Sharon Story, and I primarily have spent 34 years in public education. I have taught biology, AP chemistry, uh, honors chemistry, and then I spent the last five years of my career in central office as an instructional coach. And so now I'm excited to do the distance learning with these three wonderful ladies, and we are, are just so excited about our agenda, and we're glad that you could join us today. Well, a little bit of health. And introduce our speaker, Dr. Carla Duff. Um, we are using WebEx as our webinar environment. So this just kind of gives you a little highlight of the screen that you see. And then on the right hand side, you'll see um, a participant panel, a chat panel, and a QA panel. Um, during this presentation, we would like for you to uh, put in any questions that you might have into the QA section. And then at the end of our session, if we have a little bit of time, we will try to answer those questions uh, for time's sake so that our presenter can uh, kind of talk to our audience and uh, not have to wait through the entire webinar. Uh, we will go in and I'll collect all of those Q&As and all those questions that you have. And then we will hold, uh, I'll have a blog page to where um, Dr. Dove uh, will be able to answer some of those questions for you that I will post uh, for you out this, this week. So please hold and, and put any questions that you might have, just knowing that we will get to it either at the end of the session or we will get to it uh, off of our blog page. The chair is showing us about chat and the Q&A. Again, those are the panels in the WebEx on the right-hand side. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I think most of you have seen where that is located. And we've seen some questions come in. And uh, do be patient with us so that we'll answer those as soon as we possibly can. Marin or Pam would like to tell you about how uh, this is our sponsorship and kind of where this uh, club uh, originated. We're fortunate through the National Science Foundation that Research and STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Well, here at Texas Tech, we have a unit a part that deals with STEM education and, and uh, outreach. So they communicate all over, not just through Texas Tech, but for the nation. With the ma'am, we've got funding to be able to put this on. So we're very grateful for that. Now, before we get started, as our webinar says, it's about forensic ornithology, and we want to make sure we make good use of our presenter's time, of our, our guest speaker. So I'm going to let Sharon do a little interaction to 
to Dr. Cordova and tell you just a little bit about her, and then I'll pass the mic off to Dr. Dove, and that way she can um, talk to our audience and tell us a little bit about what she does and and what her uh, career and job, kind of how she got there, and and what all of that entails. So. She we're very fortunate to have Dr. Dove with us today, and we're very excited that she took the time out of her busy spend some time with us to give you the most up-to-date and the best expert in the field. She is Associate of Applied Science from Lord Fairfax Community College. She has a BS from University of Montana. She has a Master's from George Mason University, and a PhD is from George Mason University. So is the leading forensic ornithology with the Smithsonian Institute. She's won numerous bird strikes cases and is one of the leading scientists that we know of on the subject of, of forensic ornithology. And we want to welcome Dr. Dove and allow her to make her comments and allow her to talk to you so that you'll have a little idea how exactly she got started in the field and exactly what she does on a day-to-day -day basis. Dr. Dove? Okay, Dr. Dove, I'm passing the mic off. Hear me? I can. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, for having me. It's my pleasure, and this is my first webinar, so you have to bear with me if I make a few technical errors here. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for, for inviting me to join this very interesting uh, seminar that you're putting on here. Um, you pretty much have covered basically my education, but I'd just like to point out that. There are a few really important things that happened to me over the course of my education and career that really focused me on this field because, as you all know, it is a very specific field. And those things happened to be I had some very, very great mentors along the way. Um, I should add out into resources thinking that maybe I wanted to be a game warden or a park ranger. And it so happens that I had a very good uh, ornithology professor at Lord Fairfax who was interested in birds and sort of guided me that way. And when I uh, started my position here at the Smithsonian Institution in the museum collections area, I also met a very important mentor there, and that was Roxy Laybourne. And Roxy is really the pioneer of what is now known as forensic ornithology because she took techniques of forensic science and applied them to ornithology in a way that allowed her to identify birds from tiny bits and pieces of trace evidence that she received from from bird aircraft collisions and so it's not a forensic science lab in that we're not certified and board oriented or anything like that what we really do is just use the forensic techniques and forensic technology and apply that to ornithology forensic science lab that's official forensic science lab national oregon and it's a u.s fish and wildlife service lab and they actually do the court cases and do some testimonies, and they actually have a completely certified forensics lab where they work a lot with bird, uh, bird poaching problems. So if there are any legal uh, poaching events or customs or anybody is, is trying to figure out what birds are being imported to this country illegally, uh, that forensic lab usually comes into play. Most of our da daily duties include identifying birds from bird strikes, or maybe birds that are found in prey mains or in food contaminants. And we actually have worked with the FBI on a few uh, homicide cases. It's actually a program where you can get a degree in forensic ornithology. I'm not aware of that, if there is a program with that specific um, done in it. Curriculum. Sorry, I missed the part of that question. Do you do internships with students from other colleges? Yeah, we do. As a matter of fact, I have a Fulbright scholar here in my lab right now who is conducting specialized research on the microscopic structure of feathers in uh, the group of seabirds. Um, he started and he will be here for nine months. He's from Brazil. Um, prior to that, I had a postdoctoral fellow that was here from Canada for one year who uh, 
who did some work on uh, feather identification for the Canadian bird strikes. So there are some internships. They are very few and very, very um, competitive. Uh, do take interns and students on uh, a fairly regular basis in our lab. I'm sure about the one in Oregon, but I'm sure you know they may have some kind of program there also. Do you about these internships? I think there are online. Uh, I know that the Smithsonian has an online page uh, for internships and scholarships. A lot of the the projects are not funded or have don't really have any funding. Of involve them here. I'm pretty sure that the uh, forensic lab probably has some kind of contact for uh, volunteers or interns also. So. What your, your uh, normal day is like? Yes. Right now our normal day is extremely busy and that's because fall migration has started. So all of the birds that migrated up here in spring to breed have had their young they're young, and now they're all going to head south together. And so the morning begins with us coming in, uh, catching up from the day before. Then we um, open the mail, and we receive our cases through the mail. And so we check them all in. We have 4,000 cases per year. So that equates to about 18 to 20 per day. And during the migration season, it's usually even busier. So in the mail and we sort it and we determine which bird strike cases we will be able to do using the whole feather characters by going into the museum collection and matching up the whole feathers with museum specimens. And the other part of it is which which cases will have to go to the DNA lab. And once we separate those, then we start the sampling and we start the identification process. If the DNA sample, then it has to be uh, submit to our DNA lab, which we have right here in our same building. And that usually takes five to six days to get the identification back. That's because we try to send our DNA samples through in full deep plates. And at the current level of production, that's about 96, identif or 96 cases per plate. Well, this rate, it doesn't take us long to fill up that plate. And so we, we save those up until we get a full plate because it's more cost effective. The case is simply a matter of looking at the whole feathers or the microscopic structure of the feather to go with that identification. And we can usually do that in one day. And that's because we have a lot of experience. I've been doing this for about 22 years. One of the assistants has been here for 10 years. And so we have a good idea of what birds will be involved in these bird strikes. And usually it's common species, things like moor doves, horn larks. Canada geese, the kind of birds that you might expect would want to hang out on a flat field or a flat area where they can see predators, they can rest, and they can also feed. And so we have um, a good idea of what what species, and there are about 100 common species involved in bird strikes, and that's usually where we start our process. It's sort of like a process of elimination. So it's usually pretty busy. Uh, once we get the identifications completed, we come back to our online databases and fill those in, send those reports out to the field personnel who collect the data, and uh, then start the process all over again. How do you think in the Texas area, which is where we are in the Oklahoma area, we have your experience uh, a drought right now, and we are, of course, having limited feeding for our migratory birds. How do you think this is going to affect uh, bird strikes in this area? Well, that's an interesting question, and that's probably something that will be looked at at the field personnel um, down the road, maybe once we have all the data in from the years. It's really difficult to compare one single event like that across um, immediate uh, conclusions from it because, you know, sometimes if birds can't find what they want, they'll just simply pick up and move on to the next spot. So you not see them there, but doesn't necessarily mean that they're not actually flying over or coming through the area. Yeah. At U.S. Uh, Air Flight 1549 that landed in the Hudson due to a bird strike, were you involved in that case at all? Yeah, we were heavily involved in that case. Um, 
maybe because we received the remains for identification, but we also use a little bit of technology in that case to try to help us determine whether or not the birds were resident birds that were there in New York for the whole year or if they were actually from a migratory population that had bred up north and only uh, had come down to New York for the winter time. So the first aspect of our involvement in that case was identification. And although the pilot, you know, the pilots both said they thought they were Canada geese, we really had to follow through on that and make sure of that identification because there's a species of bird in New York that looks very similar to a Canada goose and it's called a brant goose. A little bit smaller, it has the same color pattern color patterns. It lacks the white chin strap but it does have a neck strap uh, which is white and so the problems of those birds in New York have been increasing over the past years so we have to first of all make sure of the identification. The Canada goose weighs about 8 to 10 pounds and the Brant goose weighs 3 to 5 pounds so the engines of the uh, aircraft that went down into the Hudson were really designed to take a 4 pound bird and fly. And when engines are designed, they are designed with bird strikes in mind because they have to be able to take a bird and keep and keep on functioning because that's part of of the decline is sucking in birds. In this case, years were very happy to find out that yes, indeed, it was the Canada goose that went into these engines, and it was a bird that weighed eight pounds, which was more than the four pound standard uh, their aircraft was designed for. Had it been the brand which is a three to five pound bird, there would have been some questions as to the uh, efficiency of that engine because if it was designed for a four pound bird and it had taken in three pound bird, there would have been a problem. So identification was first and foremost in that case. But certainly we have a, a stable, hydrogen stable isotope lab here at the museum and a lot of work in recent years on identifying birds breeding grounds based on the uh, state isotopes in their feathers and, and the reason it's been applied to birds is because usually when birds are breeding they're also molting on those breeding grounds so when they are eating and feeding on the available to them they are taking in the elements of their environment at that point in time they migrate south and when they migrate south they will have a different signature because their their feathers will have the isotopic profile that they uh, when they were living in the north and molting. So in case we said, hey, hey, let's look at feathers from the engine and get the isotopic values from those feathers and then compare those values to the birds currently in New York that are known to be residents because they have bands around their legs and necks that indicate they are there all year and then see how our values compare. So what we found is the, the uh, feathers that we received from the resident birds the topic values did not overlap at all with the FET we reached from the engines of the aircraft. In fact, when we looked at museum specimens of the breeding grounds, those values overlapped a deal with the ones that came out of the engine. And our conclusions were that the birds that went into 1549 engines were not the resident birds that breed in New York all year, but rather birds that had come down to New York to winter. And then it made sense because the birds occurred at 3,000 feet and most of these lazy, fat, resident Canada birds are not going to get up and fly that high when they can just walk over to the next park and feed. And so uh, all of the pieces of that puzzle then started to fit together and we were very confident with our conclusion that these were indeed migratory birds. Can you give an example of you were talking about isotopes that you found in the birds? Can you give us an example of what isotopes you're looking at? Different kinds of isotopes, and, and I'm not the expert on that. I guess what I just say is that when you're in a forensic world, you really need to think about more than just your specialty. You need to think about other people that work with you and how you can network with those people and utilize their expertise and their skills. But basically what it is, it's elements. It's just like the element in the environment. And people have been studying these long enough. We, we actually used hydrogen isotopes in this study. There are nitrogen isotopes and oxygen isotopes. 
and people have been studying these long enough that they have sort of come up with some kind of um, like a, a latitudinal profile for our country that will take values of this hydrogen isotope in an organic object over a, a um, soil like, like go to the plant store and you buy a plant that will tell you which region you can plant this in most successfully. Well, they've kind of split up the hydrogen isotope profiles into those same kind of gradations. So you get values that you extract from feathers or from tissue or whatever material you're looking at, compare those across the scale and figure out where your organic uh, item may fit in. So what it is really, we just took advantage of expertise that we have available here at the Smithsonian. How do you collect it? Is it available to everyone or do you have to be uh, just at the Smithsonian to get it? No, I think that actually uh, as long as it's a research-oriented project, you can find collaborators within the Smithsonian that would probably be happy to help you. A new lab here, and so it's just getting started, and I think there are probably other labs at universities and research institutions that might even do this kind of service for a fee. For adding and being our expert because you've added and opened up our, our knowledge base tremendously. We don't know what we would have done without you today. You would have been fine. <laughs> Join us if you'd like and stay online or and watch the rest of the presentation or if you need to go, we understand. We want the kids to know though that you will be answering our questions and we appreciate that so that now that they have the true expert answer. Thank you very much. And, I, I, and uh, but what I'll do is I'll just collect all of the questions um, that come in at the end of this presentation, as well as uh, email questions that I receive. And what I'll do is I'll put those all together in an email and send those to you so that I try not to take up as much time as possible and make it uh, easy for you. And if you like Thank, Thank you for having me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And good luck to everybody out there who uh, is interested in the field. It's very exciting. The slide that you uh, are looking at now, this is a very uh, noted event that occurred. And what did we really know about the picture? It was very, it became very uh, fast and occupied the news for several days. Uh, how if you knew that the picture was associated with a person named Captain Slee? And this is a graph of U.S. Air Force Flight 1549 that was cleared for takeoff from New York's LaGuardia Airport. And the airport was en route to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And what happened was it had to be ditched in the Hudson River exactly six minutes after it was took off. If you look map here, you can see what happened. It started from Libya. It then went over the Bronx. And then you can see it made a sudden turn in, uh, in, uh, across the Hudson River. It then crashed in the Hudson River and made a uh, water landing. We want to look at the news clip that occurred in, uh, after this was featured. What went away for just a few minutes because it does take just a couple of minutes for this uh, video to uh, download on your machine or at least buffer through. So in just a couple of minutes here, then we will start this video that was shown on, on the sedation. When this happened, as we're waiting for everybody to join on, let's just go back and think about this. You remember being sitting there watching the news, hearing it on the radio, 
and no, noticing that this happened. I know when it happened for me, I was thinking, oh, does it really happen? Do birds actually get stuck in the engine? And I know that sounds pretty naive, but I guess we need a sheltered life to a certain extent. It wasn't always available. I wasn't always thinking about the fact that actually plane crashes, plane ditching, instances that would happen due to the fact that birds would get into engines. So then, of course, it makes me paranoid, so I start to think again. That also um, made us think about, well, this is pretty interesting, and I wonder how often this all happens. So as we're studying this, we to the conclusion, well, let's look at this more carefully, and it makes you think every time you get on the airplane, what's going to happen. And here in just a minute, Pam is going to go through some statistics with you, because we found a wonderful website that shows you just exactly how many bird strikes occur in your area per year. You can break it down according to uh, the airline that you're on or according to the area. And we were really surprised to find out, even in our isolated area, how many bird strikes actually do occur in our area. It's just like uh, Dr. Dove said, though, most of the bird strikes that occur are under the weight limit. And so because they're under the weight limit, and they don't really do anything to the plane itself. at what forensic ornithology is. Forensic ornithology is the study that identifies bird species involved in accidents, crimes, and the likes from scraps or tissues or feathers that are left. This is the definition that was given to us by Dave Melman, who is the director of the National Conservatory of Migrant Bird Program. One of the areas that we did not list on here that Dr. Dove brought up was the one importing uh, animals from other parts of the country and bringing them in illegally. So they find remains of these birds that are not typical, not uh, 
uh, formerly found in the United States or in that area, that we can find out what is going on because not all birds species do we want to be in a certain area. Also, we cannot identify the kind of accident. There is nothing that we can do to prevent accident from occurring in the future. So as you noticed on the clip, on the video clip, they talked about they shot off cannons at some of the more uh, uh, airports where birds were, strikes were more common. If we didn't know what kind of birds that there were then, if this was a problem, then the cannons would have never been thought of as a solution. So trying to relocate some of the birds so that they no longer are a problem. Because we have to survive together in our world. We cannot eliminate. Everybody has a purpose. Where math come into all of this? Because math is usually just a tool. It's something that you use in all these other fields. It comes in. It naturally blends with the science. They always there's always a marriage it seems of math and science because math is the tool that scientists need. But when we're looking at all of this and we're thinking about the number sense and the, the amount of mathematical content that you would need to have for for fields. As you, as you spend time in your classroom, important and in, in your study of mathematics, it's important for you to have conceptual understanding of certain things. It's important for you to have numbers sense. Nine, the disadvantages that most of us don't always acquire our number sense until we're the adult. When you study statistics and mathematics, it's exciting, and I'm somewhat of a little data nerd at times. To look at it and to look at the statistics and see how you can do learn things from the statistics. When we were researching this. We found a really neat website from the Federal Aviation Administration. Use it to wildlife strike database. So when you go to this site, what you're going to have a zip file that's going to be there. You're going to unzip it and you're going to find a file and a database. And so look at this now. In database, it's like a several columns of a heading. Probably more information, it's going to take you more than 30 minutes to sit down and look and play with it because it kind of eats your time after a while because you sit there and you're just fascinated by all the information that's available. Well, if you're interested in different kinds of airplanes, you're going to be able to see all kinds of things, mechanical issues and things about the making of airplanes. You're all going to see what happens at different airports, the different kinds of birds, what kind of damage was done, and dates when this occurred. So then we go back to talk about, about you go and think about what Dr. Dove had to say today. That makes me think of Canada geese. In all the books, every year, we look forward to thinking of the can Canadian geese as they fly in and stop. And we've got many um, fields that have cotton, hay, yellow, corn, different fields. And these birds come here, and then we've got several playa lakes. Well, birds come every year, and we kind of look forward to it. This year, with all the changes, I'm going to kind of wonder, what's going to happen now? Are these birds still come, and how, how is this going to affect anything? Well, what was I looked at this database. I looked at a data, the database, and you open it. The first Thing that you, the first slide you, you're going to you're at now is what you see when you open the file. Notice the name operator is. Operator is the kind of airline. So know that first one that we're seeing when it opens up was at military. The thing called next to operator is A type, and that refers to the kind of airplane. Let's go to the next one. What I'm curious about is, that, okay, so let's make this simple. I usually fly on Southwest Airlines. We only have one airport here. So what I want to do is I love it and maybe bird strikes that I have no no understanding or no knowledge of it happening. What happens? Um, I hit the little arrow by operator and I click on select all so that it Deselects everything in there, and then scrolls all the way down to where I found Southwest Airlines. And of course, sometimes I'd make mistakes and didn't. At one point, I chose South 
uh, it was Southeast Airlines is going to appear on there too. And I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense. Well, I had chosen the wrong one. Went back down and I chose Southwest Airlines and I clicked OK on that. And what I see is then now it's going to give me all the airplanes that are just Southwest Airlines. I mean, occurrences that were just for Southwest Airlines. If you look at that, then that column that's highlighted with the orange and the black give you the bird strikes that occurred on Southwest Airlines. And then when I look at that next column where it says A type, it tells me the type of plane. Well, not being too knowledgeable about airplanes, it means, well, I can always go and figure out, well, what is the makings of these airplanes? My doctor Dove said, what well, kind of birds can survive some airstrikes with these planes? So when I went to that second column, and I chose the air, I went to the airport and I went down and I did the same thing I had done before. Hit the little arrow. I hit the select all so that everything would be deselected. I scroll down and I chose Lubbock International Airport. And we laugh in Lubbock because Lubbock's a small town, but we're an international airport. So we always, we just kind of get a giggle out of that one. So I got and what happens is, is you can see chose Lubbock International, click A, and that gave me all the bird strikes that had occurred in Lubbock at, at the airport. So I thought, I wonder what's happened this year in 2011. How many bird strikes have happened this year? So then what I did was I went to the incident date, which is incident B, and I chose the little arrow, did the same thing that I had done before. Before. Those of you that have not used a spreadsheet or a database of this type, you need to play with it a little bit and don't worry about it because you're not going to do anything to it. And so you just, and if you get stuck, then you go back and you select all. And you're where you started from. So in this case, I chose again the little arrow, went down, chose select all that it would deselect everything because the little check marks are there. All the way down. And I think that in 2011, I was kind of glad because in 2011, we only had four incidents, incidences so far. And as you can see, January 2nd, February 20th, April 17th, and April 17th, it makes me think of uh, um, Easter time. And May 30th, and I'm thinking about when school's out, when public school's always out. So I looked at these and I thought, well, that's good because there's only been four occurrences. So I marked those four and I clicked on OK. And what happened was well, then it showed me, and you can't go from here. You have to scroll all the way across. It'll tell you the day. It'll tell you the type of airplane. It'll tell you the type of bird. It, it's just interesting to see. And you can go there because if you get interested in it, I would challenge you to go area where you airport or an airport close to you or you fly and do this and see what happens. Then you can take further by saying, okay, you could call by calling the airport and asking to talk to somebody there about that instance incident that might be more interesting to me. So I think that as you do this, you might have fun playing with this and I hope that some of you will. We had a Dr. Dove uh, spoke to us earlier. This was the, the screenshot that shows that gives her some of education and her research interest. But we do have a video that we can show you um, about me, our scientist, Carla Dove. Um, she is one that um, is a video that's going to show you kind of what her surrounding plot at the Smithsonian Lab. It lets her give you another little bit of an introduction to.
to look into the video and then we'll watch. I had one question about the bird strikes that occur in San Angelo, Texas, and if that is a problem or not. But Pam has showed you how to use that data link. We would challenge you to go back because this is a question you can now explore and answer on. So go back to the major website that she gave you from the uh, FAA and download and your airport and your knowledge that you have and see just see what type of bird strikes you have. Or, at San Angelo, whether this is a problem or not. Also, kind of begin to look at your migratory bird patterns. Is there a problem uh, with bird strikes more at one time of the year than there is at another? This is something that you can also find out with the data that Pam has showed you how to use on the, the spreadsheet. The other thing I tell you is that I was thinking, oh my goodness, when I go back to, when I go back to Washington this time, I actually want to go I know something specific about this, one of the Smithsonian's. I want to go and I want to see if I can go in part of the lab or visit that area to see what goes on. I mean, from the video that you're about to see, you're going to see that it's an amazing place. And the collection of bird feathers and facts that they have about these birds, I just found it fascinating. And before all of this, it would have never occurred to me to do that. But it's fun though when you go to the if you have ever been to Washington and you go to the museum, you have an opportunity to see one more thing, one more part of it that you may not have thought about seeing before. And again, I'll hold off and wait just, just a few more, uh, just, a, just a couple of minutes here or just a few seconds while everyone's video uh, sinks in and downloads just to make sure that everyone can, can view that. So give us just a couple minutes and things should sink in and the back here so that you can watch the video with us. So that everyone realizes with all of our attendees, uh, again, I apologize for any wait time, but this wait time is just waiting for all computers, for all of the attendees to sync up. Um, so the video can be watched on your end. And um, so that, that's why we kind of have this little wait time until I see that, that all of the computers that are connected to this webinar are then going to be able to watch um, the, the video um, successfully. So I appreciate your patience. I should not be much longer, just about three or four more attendees' computers, and we should be done. To remind all of our attendees at this point is that this uh, webinar is being recorded and so if for some reason you're not able to see that first video or for some reason the video doesn't come through on the end uh, for the Dr. Carla Dove video then this will be archived so that it will be placed on our website. It probably I'll probably also send it out in an email link so that everyone can have it available to them if you attend this webinar. But we'll post it on the uh, TTU um, ISD Club Science uh, webpage so that if there are some problems with not being able to sync into our video due to your computer, then uh, you'll be able to watch it on the archive um, after the webinar is over and once I have a little time this afternoon to post that archive.
hope that we are pretty close to uh, everything synced into the video. I'm going to go ahead and start the Dr. Carla Dove video. And again, for some reason, if the video doesn't play on your screen, uh, please don't forget we will have it archived and available for you to view and watch uh, another way instead of uh, actually synced in and in real time. Presentation, and we have hopefully opened your mind to an area that you didn't know a lot about. Let's look at some of the things that you might want to explore on your own. So is, is there a relationship between the size of the bird and the damage that is done to the plane, or does the size of the plane make a difference? Mr. Duff told us that the size of the bird made a big difference, but what if the size of the plane? Is that going to make a difference at all? speed have any effect on the damage done to the plane? If a plane is just taking off and it's going at a very slow taxi uh, speed, is that make a difference than uh, if it meets birds in uh, flight when it's already taken off? Is it region or some factors to consider? Do all migrate at the same time? Is the region that they're in going to make a difference according to the size? Look at it and see if you can't justify your answer. Is for ornithology the only career path that you can see that has happened uh, from this presentation? 
Are there fields that can be affected by bird strikes? I know in our area right now, one of the big things that is happening is we're having a large number of wind generators being placed up. With the wind generators, is that going to be a factor that we have to look at with the bird strikes also? Are we now going to infringe on the birds' habitat even more? Is that something that is going to affect the migratory patterns of our birds? Are the wind generators going to be a problem? So if you find an area that you're really, really interested in, you need to start looking at the educational background necessary for, the for this occupation or for this field of study. If you don't want to be 45 and all of a sudden decide that you want to be a forensic ornithologist because at that point in your life, are you going to have enough time to get the education background and to get all of the necessary prereqs uh, and all of the necessary uh, things in order to fill your dreams? The coursework that would be necessary for this occupation or field of study. If you look at the statistics and database that Pam showed you, that would be somebody that would be totally different than just the scientist themselves. Or is that something that, as a scientist, you would need to know how to put that database together also? Do the two uh, interlock? Do they interweave in their field of study? Exaggerating, are bird strikes really a problem to everyone? You go back and look at that database and see just exactly how big of a problem they are. Especially if you look at your area. Is it a problem for one particular airline more than another? If it is more of a problem for one airline over another one, is that due to the area or the region in which they are located? Because Southwest, does Southwest fly all over the United States and all over the world? So are airstrikes more of a problem for Southwest because of its location? If so, what would that be? Be sure you look, we hope that we have just kind of piqued your interest and piqued your curiosity. Don't forget that the question and answer section will be up on your uh, webinar for the next five days and that we will be giving those answers. So you want to check back with the webinar and the blog uh, from time to time to see if somebody has asked the same question that you have. Or if you have any problems with the database, then we will be glad to answer those questions for you. The, on the uh, website for the TTYSC Math Club webpage, uh, well, the, the blog webpage is one that I'll be updating. But what will happen is you'll need to go in if you have a particular question that you have to ask uh, concerning this area or concerning uh, anything that you'd like to ask Dr. Carla Dove at the Smithsonian. What I'll ask that you do is off of our website, uh, you see the link for the questions. Off of our website, if you will go in and click on the Ask a Question link and submit your question to me. What we'll do is each day this week, I'll collect those questions and then I'll send those to Dr. Dove. And then once she has time uh, at the end of her day, she's going to answer those questions that come in. Then I'll go back in and I'll post those answers from Dr. Dove to our follow-up question blog that will show up on the web page. So uh, please try to make sure that you send all of your questions to us, that we can uh, just make good use of Dr. Carla Dove's time at the Smithsonian, and that we get uh, just the one question. There may be several of you that ask questions, so the way she doesn't receive it over and over, I'll be able to kind of uh, catalog it and put in a category and ask her that question one time, and then post it on our um, app. That. But I'd also like to show and point out is we do have some upcoming webinars. The next one we have um, set up for Tuesday, October 18, noon, which is still daylight. We're going to be talking about pyrotechnics and fireworks. Please make sure also that periodically that you check with our webpage because we, if there's any kind of a schedule conflict or if there's any kind of um, a, a time change or a date change, then that will be noted on that website so that you can make the appropriate change. So I'll receive the email if you have not become a member of the TTU as the Math Science Club. I'd like to encourage you to do so because being a member, then you're going to see the email to me with uh, any of our webinar information, with reminders, 
every single deadline throughout the school year. I also post that webinar information and registration link on the webpage. So if you happen to uh, have a friend that would like to join us but they're not a member of us, then they can do that and kind of check us out, see what things are like with our webinars, and then go in and join afterwards. So I would like to say thank you so much for joining us this first time around. We really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to seeing you in October for our next webinar. Again, post your questions. We look forward to hearing from you. Have a great day.